we have got a great speaker with us tonight. His name is Keith Dunn. He is with the John Birch Society. He is going to talk about um, uh, he's going to talk about a lot of things, okay, but institutional issues, and in particular, he's going to talk about uh, Article Five. Uh, let's give a uh, Keith lives here in in Florida. He's, he's originally from Virginia. He's got uh, five kids. Seven. Five boys. Five boys. He's been busy since the last time I met him or saw him. We won't talk about that. Uh, but uh, Keith also homeschools his children, which I think is, is fantastic considering what's happening with uh, our education system. But um, Keith has, has supported some of the things I've done over the past. He's, he's been a participant at the Florida Tea Party Convention and several other things. He's, he's come to a couple of our meetings, even on the QT. And uh, finally, I got him to uh, have time to come in and see us. And I think there's been a lot of discussion on Article 5 in the Convention of States. And now we're going to let uh, Keith Dunn from uh, the John Birch Society give us his angle on this particular issue. Let's welcome uh, Keith up here. Introduce your son, too. All right. Now my time, do I have to leave this mic here? Can I? You can move around, you can do whatever you want. All right. There, I don't feel like I'm trapped now. <clears throat> yes, I do have uh, seven children, uh, five, five boys and two girls. I'm uh, blessed to have my oldest son with me here tonight. Ian, would you please stand? <laughs> Thank you. He's, uh, he's a, a great young man who's... Uh, being used by God to do a lot of wonderful things. I'm privileged to have him here this evening to help me out uh, with the, the table of uh, information that we have. Uh, <clears throat> when I first joined the organization, came on board on staff, I was told to uh, grow the organization. So I thought, you know, hey, seven kids, you know, <laughs> how much do you want me to grow this? But that's not what they meant. Um, tonight, uh, I usually give a, a, a presentation titled Article 5, Reality versus Myth, and tonight is really a, a part two, if you will. I focus on two specific areas. And I'm going to start with our, our country's birth certif certificate, uh, which states, in part, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, to deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Here we find the purpose of government is to protect our God-given rights. Very simple. Although this is simple, um, this uh, experiment in liberty, if you will, has not been easily uh, reproduced. James Madison stated, although all men are born free and all nations might be so, yet too true it is that slavery has been the general lot of the human race. You know, people don't want to leave America and go elsewhere. They want to come here because it is not an easy thing to duplicate the freedom that we enjoy in this country. And so for that reason, I don't take this subject lightly. I don't take the Constitution lightly. <clears throat> Daniel Webster, uh, along with George Washington, both saw this uh, uh, Constitution as a miracle. Uh, Daniel Webster said, hold on, my friends, to the Constitution and the Republic for which it stands. He said, miracles do not cluster, and what has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. And so we have to be cautious in uh, how we handle uh, this precious document. Tonight, again, I'm going to talk about uh, Article 5. That's the particular section of the uh, Constitution that talks about how to introduce changes, how those changes are ratified, and it also mentions, mentions limitations. And really, this is, uh, again, a, a part two. If you want to see the, the other version, you can do so on, on uh, YouTube if you'd like. I have a sign-up sheet at my table. Uh, leave your name and email address, and I can email that out, as, as well as other uh, links that I'll be mentioning through the presentation. The first myth, if you will, that I wanted to uh, discuss 
is uh, these are these are one of the the two things I hear most uh, most often throughout my travels. Uh, the the first one we'll talk we'll talk about is uh, that an Article Five convention or amending convention or convention of the states is not a constitutional convention. <clears throat> The impression that uh, promoters of a convention will try to leave is that somehow an Article 5 convention or amending convention or convention of states is limited and that it can only change a few things within the Constitution. Opposite that is a constitutional convention or CONCON -con for short. And the idea here is that it's really unlimited. It can change a lot of the Constitution or it can change the whole thing. And so really these are the two positions that are discussed and, and promoted uh, most often when you hear people speak about this uh, particular section of the Constitution. In fact, uh, Mark Levin, uh, probably most people are familiar with him. He put out a, a book, and, and before that he had, uh, or right after that, he was on a Sean Handy special on Fox News, and he said that he was calling for a convention, not a constitutional convention, and referred to the Philadelphia Convention as a constitutional convention. In his book, he states on page 12, importantly, in neither case does an Article 5 amendment process provide for a constitutional convention. It provides for two methods of amending the Constitution. Mark Meckler, who is head of the uh, Citizens for Self-Governance, he had this to say. He said, under Article 5, the states via the state legislatures had the right to call for an amending convention. Meckler explained, and it's important that we get our language right. It's not a constitutional convention. It does not open the whole Constitution up. This is an untruth as stated by those people who are against it. It is an amending convention which must take place under the rubric of the Constitution itself. And the way it happens is 34 states issue a call for a constitutional, I'm sorry, for a convention. You'll notice that they're very specific in, in what they're trying to call for and how it's not a constitutional convention. Convention of States website in uh, October of last year had this to say, those who oppose the use of Article 5 like to use these t terms interchangeably. They say that a con con is dangerous and could result in the destruction of the American system of government. government. Any sane person, they say, wouldn't dream of pursuing a con con. Well, we agree. A constitutional convention would be dangerous, could very well result in disaster. But we don't want to call a constitutional convention. We want to call a convention of states. Again, they're, they're trying to allude that there's, there's two different types of possible conventions here, at least two. Uh, Michael Ferris heads up the convention of states, and on that website, if you look at the frequently asked uh, questions page, uh, questions posed, what is a convention of states? And the answer, a convention of states is a convention called by the state legislatures for the purpose of proposing amendments to the Constitution. They are given power to do this under Article 5 of the Constitution. It is not a constitutional convention. It cannot throw out <clears throat> the Constitution. Again, trying to point out that there's at least two different conventions that we can have. So what is the difference? Or is there a difference between all these terms that are being used? You know, if <clears throat> Eileen uh, went to a restaurant and, and she heard two argument, uh, uh, two gentlemen arguing over uh, who was the best local fisherman in town, and one guy was arguing it's it's Robert. You know, he's he catches the biggest and best fish, and the other guys disagree and say no, it's Bob. You know, Bob, he's got a golden fishing rod. Every time he you know throws a, a hook in the water, he he pulls out a fish, and they go back and forth and back and forth. And Eileen says, you know what? Let me ask you guys a question. Can you point to the gentleman that you're talking about? And at that moment, they both point to the exact same individual. So Eileen says, hey, disagreement solved. You're both referring to the same person. You just know him by a different name. How do we know whether or not we're talking about a different convention or the same convention? Simply ask, where in the Constitution grants the authority for the, con for the uh, convention you're referring to? Everyone, whether they're call, calling for a convention of states or, or talking about a constitutional convention, they're all point to this clause in Article 5 that states Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. 
We are all discussing the same convention for proposing amendments. Now what about limitations? Let's take this phrase and put it within Article 5. Okay, this is all of Article 5. Now there's a little portion here at the bottom that's missing, but that's a, that's a limitation that became obs uh, obsolete in 1808. But if you look at the, at the uh, text of Article 5, it's, it talks about Congress um, can introduce changes when both the House and the Senate uh, agree on those changes, or a convention can be called when thir uh, two thirds of the several states petition Congress for a convention, and then it talks about the ratification process. Uh, either way you introduce changes, it must be ratified either through the uh, Congress sending it back to state legislatures or through a convention uh, within each of the states. Now, the only limitation that's mentioned here is at the end. It says, provided that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. So can a convention be limited? The answer is yes. How many limits does it have? It can only have one. There's nowhere in the text of Article 5 or anywhere else in the Constitution or the Federalist Papers, Anti-Federalist Papers, any of the source documentation that say if you call X number of uh, changes or less, it's referred to as one type of convention. And if you, if you call for multiple changes or changing out the whole document, it's referred to as a constitutional convention. There's, there's nothing in here that would support that claim. We're all talking about a convention for proposing amendments. The difference is the understanding of the, the limitations. And again, the text only mentions one limitation. So the idea that a, that a convention of states is not the same thing as a constitutional convention is incorrect. Now, if, I, if we talk about the, the next biggest misunderstanding I encounter, if I, if I were to told, tell you that I had some news for you, that your spouse was faithful to you 70% of the time, would that make you warm and fuzzy? <laughs> no, you'd be livid, you'd be angry. Any person in their right mind would be upset. <clears throat> but, you know, I have a solution for you. You know, 70% faithfulness is not acceptable. We need to, we need to have 100% faithfulness, correct? I mean, that's what the marriage vows are intended for, um, is faithfulness to one another. And so I'm going to propose a solution. But before I do, I have to warn you. There's some people out there that are going to try to tell you that you need to change the ways of your cheating spouse. Now, that's ridiculous, okay? That's just silly. In fact, they're enemies of marriage, all right? So beware of them, all right? Now, the solution, if you want to, want to restore your marriage, this is really your only hope that you have. It's the best hope you have, and that's to change your marriage vows. How many of you are ready to hire me as a marriage counselor? <laughs> Certainly not. <clears throat> the idea that uh, we can change in a, the for better or for worse part or in sickness and health or maybe we'll add a, a balanced love amendment where they have to love us as much as we love them would be silly. We understand that in the context of, of, uh, of marriage. Yet, there is the biggest misunderstanding with this Article 5 debate, I believe, in the fact that people are saying that somehow the Constitution is at fault. It's deficient, it's flawed, it's broken, defective. And the only way out of this mess, okay, the only way out of this is to change the document. How does that sound? Well, sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, put forth and it sounds pretty good. But let's examine this idea for a minute, okay? Will this really cure the ails of, uh, of uh, things that ails America? Probably the biggest change that I, I hear quite often is the balanced budget amendment. We've got to rein in the, the federal spending, right? You look at some of the spending that Congress has done over the years, and there's a couple of websites at the bottom. Uh, Citizens for Government Waste, they produce what's known as a pig book. Uh, Senator Tom Coburn uh, produced what's known as a waste book. Uh, those links, I would encourage you to visit and check out some of this. This is just a small tip of the iceberg. It's the tip of the tip of the iceberg. $147 million to subsidize Brazilian cotton farmers. $27 million for Moroccan uh, pottery classes. 
65 million for tour tourism related TV advertisements in New York and New Jersey. 379 million to promote Obamacare and a website that doesn't work. 1.1 million for sidewalks to nowhere in, in Florida and Michigan. 5.2 million to pay for a museum of neon signs. All these items and all the items listed on, on those uh, uh, two uh, websites have one thing in common besides the millions of dollars that they're spending, and that is it's all unconstitutional. There, none of these items are permitted by the Constitution. If you look at the Constitution, you'll find what's known as the power of enumeration. Uh, which simply is uh, the idea that power does not belong to the federal government unless it's granted to it through the Constitution, through the document itself. Okay, so our Constitution didn't, the, the federal government didn't start off with 100% power and we whittle away to, at, at its authority with the Constitution. It started out with zero and it was granted authority, granted areas that it can be involved with um, through the enumeration in the uh, Constitution. In Article 6, we find that every elected and appointed official at the federal, state, and local level take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Everybody takes an oath to abide by the limitations of this document. Section 9 tells us, uh, of uh, Article 1, Section 9 tells us that Congress can only um, uh, appropriate spending through the passage of legislation. So if it wants to spend any money, it has to do so through a passage of a bill. In Article 1, Section 8, we find that the only bills that it can pass are in areas that are granted to it by the Constitution. So if education is not granted to the federal government by the Constitution, can it pass a bill appropriating money for, the, for education? The answer is no, it cannot. And finally, at the end, the, the 10th Amendment, a founding fathers put a big old period at the end, said any, uh, any areas not delegated by the Constitution to the federal government are reserved to the states and to the people. Folks, that's pretty clear, okay? It's clear what Congress can spend money on and what it cannot. Madison said in Federalist 45, he said the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined few, and they're defined. They will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. The powers reserved to the states, several states, will extend to all the objects which in an ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people. What about the uh, general welfare clause? Doesn't that kind of open things up a little bit? Well, he mentioned that in Federalist 41. He said, for what purpose could the enumeration of particular powers be inserted if these and all others were meant to be included in the preceding general power? Nothing is more natural nor common than first to use a general phrase and then to explain and qualify it by recital of particulars. He said, why would we bother listing anything if it was all covered under the, the general welfare statement? That's not what the intention was. So the powers are few. The powers are defined. It is specified what Congress can spend money on. Anything is not mentioned is hands off. You look at these areas, foreign aid. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say federal government can give money away to foreign countries. Uh, protection of the environment. And, you know, Keith, are you telling me you don't like clean water, clean air? Of course not. I, I love those things. But is it the responsibility of the federal government to oversee that? No. Housing, health care, education. Don't you like educated children? Of course. But is it the responsibility of the federal government to provide that? Absolutely not. Transportation, energy, agriculture, all these things are off limits. Folks, you can't make these any more unconstitutional than they already are. Okay? If you go into a morgue and you stab a cadaver, you can't make them more dead. All right? You can't kill a dead guy twice. <clears throat> so what's the problem? If it's not the Constitution, if it's not the document. The Constitution is not a self-enforcing document, okay? The words are not going to leap from the page and make the, the public office holder abide by its limitations. 
If the Constitution is to have any power at all, it has to come from the people who created the federal government, which are the states and we the people. Now, how do the states check the federal government? How do they enforce the Constitution? Before the 17th Amendment, the way the Constitution was originally created, the state had a voice in Congress. Okay, they appointed the U.S. Senators. So if legislation moved through the House and came to the Senate that encroached on the state's uh, authority, the U.S. Senators would say, no, we can't do that. And in fact, they did um, more times than, than not uh, uh, before the 17th Amendment was adopted. But the 17th Amendment changed that, took the state's voice away, and now we have Senators directly elected by we the people. So the states lost their voice in the Senate at that moment. Which brings up another point. Uh, some advocates of a convention will say, well, you know, you still have to have, you know, 38 states to approve, you know, anything uh, that comes out of convention, and they'll never approve anything bad. The same checks were in place for the 17th Amendment. That wasn't good. What about the 16th Amendment? How many would say that was a good amendment? The, the provisions in Article 5 that's supposed to check bad amendments, they were still there during the 16th Amendment. That got passed. We know the 18th Amendment was bad because we repealed it with the 21st. So the, the idea that uh, you know 38 states will check anything that, that comes out of it that, that may be, uh, might not be in our best interest doesn't show historically. Um, but going back to states, how do, how do states interpose themselves? On a, on a tyrannical federal government. Has anyone heard of nullification? Nullification is the idea that states refuse to implement unconstitutional laws, programs. And people like to say the states have a right to nullify laws. I would say the states have a duty, they have a responsibility to nullify unconstitutional laws. They take the same oath to uphold the Constitution. Okay, so when things like Real ID or, or red light cameras or Common Core are passed, you know, through the federal government, the states are enticed with aid to support those things. The state should say no, can't do that. That's not part of your jurisdiction. But we know here in Florida, as residents of Florida, we've accepted the money for for the red light cameras, for the for the Real ID. Uh, speaking to uh, Sherry uh, about that earlier. We've taken that money, we've implemented those unconstitutional laws. You know, Common Core, um, that was terrible because we actually took the money without the uh, regulations and laws being written beforehand. We said, we'll adopt them whenever you pass them, just give us the money now. <clears throat> so what about... Um, what about this idea of nullification? Why, why don't we see this uh, more often? I think Joe Wolverton said it best in one of his articles, uh, Article 5 Group Ignores State's Complicity in Federal Power Grab. He said, the claim that the federal government is seizing power from the states cannot be stipulated to without falsely portraying states as victims rather than accomplices to these crimes against the Constitution. States on average receive one-third of their annual budget from the federal government. One-third. Look at this chart here. Alaska, on one end of the spectrum, 24% of their general revenue is through federal aid. At the other end, Mississippi. Mississippi receives 49% of its general revenue through federal aid. You're asking states to cut out a quarter to almost a half of their funding by staying up and refusing those programs. That's politically un unpopular. You know, we're expecting them to either cut back on programs that they offer or raise the taxes in the states, and states don't like to do that. Look at Florida. Florida is almost 37% of its general revenues are supported by the federal government. Is there any reason why they don't use nullification? What about we the people? Show of hands, how many have served on a, on a grand jury? Grand jury? Okay. What about on a uh, trial jury? You've actually rendered a verdict. Okay. A few more hands. What about vote? Who voted in the last election? 
Okay. That is a good reflection of the percentage of people that can use those three types of ways of checking the federal government. Not a lot of people will serve on a grand jury. A few more will serve on a trial jury. Everybody will vote. So we have a responsibility with that vote. President Garfield said the people are responsible for the character of Congress. He said if that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand those high qualities. We are responsible for our elected officials. Noah Webster put it like this. He says the citizens neglect their duty. What's their duty? If they neglect their duty, we'll come back to that, and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted, laws will be made not for the public good. If a Republican government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens elect bad men to make and administer their laws. Thomas Jefferson said that a nation can't be both ignorant and free. It's never been uh, that way in history and it'll never be that way in the future. We cannot be ignorant. We can't be ignorant of our elected officials, of, of where they stand on issues, on laws that they're promoting. So what is our duty as citizens? We must know the standard by which we are to measure our elected officials. How can we know if they're doing the correct thing if we don't understand the, the measuring tool uh, to, to uh, place up to them? Okay? We have to know the Constitution. There's a, a series, a, a DVD series called The Constitution is a Solution. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend that. Uh, but we have to know the document, the law of the land. We have to know who represents us the federal, state, and local level. How can we evaluate anyone if we don't know who represents us at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level? We have to monitor where they stand on issues. Where do they stand on things that are important to us? Uh, what kind of bills are they sponsoring? And I spoke before uh, a group a while ago, and uh, we talked about the um, violation of freedom of speech in, in a, a bill that was signed into law a couple years ago. And they had thought that their Republican congressman probably voted against it. But they were surprised when they found out not only did he vote for it, but he was actually the one who sponsored it, who brought it up for consideration. If we don't know what things that they're, they're, they're promoting, how can we hold them accountable? And we have to know how they're voting. How are they voting on the various issues? With these things, we have to hold our elected officials accountable. We have to refuse to re-elect candidates that consistently violate their oath of office. Can we change a cheating congressman by changing the Constitution? No. I, I blurred this out. Uh, you know, this is the, the congressman who represents this district. I'm, I'm not here to pick on any one person. I could probably put anybody up here. But so you know, your congressman in this area that we're standing in today, during his first term in office, he was faithful to the Constitution 67% of the time, according to our Freedom Index. It's a congressional scorecard. I have samples of them up at the uh, table if you like to, to uh, get a few copies. His current term, he has been faithful to his oath 73% of the time. The cumulative score, 69%. Now, remember when I asked the question, if, if you would be happy if your spouse was faithful to you 70% of the time? Why would we accept anything less from our elected officials? This is why we're in the mess we're in today. It's not because the Constitution is defective. It's because they're disregarding the limitations that are clearly specified. Even if we change the Constitution through a convention, we still have that problem of enforcement. Okay, if we can't enforce the Tenth Amendment now, how are we going to enforce any new amendment? The document is not the problem. And so the two biggest issues, fallacies, if you will, that I run into are these two. One is that uh, convention of states or Article 5 convention is not the same thing as a constitutional convention. We're talking about the same convention for proposing amendments. What we need to do is to um, force them to point to the Constitution, show me where are the limitations specified, because they can only point to one. 
That's at the end of Article 5. There is no such thing as, as X number amendments and fewer. It's called one thing, and anything over that is called something else. And the idea that the Constitution must be changed, we have to change the document in order to uh, fix our nation's most pressing problems, not true. <clears throat> if the Constitution is not the problem, how can changing it be a viable solution? You know, show me we, where we've exhausted nullification at the state level. Show me where we've exhausted our option of, of the voting booth. Uh, just by simply going and, and polling uh, people, at, pick a spot. Ask them who the representatives are. You may be surprised how many people don't know who their state reps are, their state senators. And if we, again, if we don't know who they are, what they're pushing, promoting, how they're voting, how can we say that we've truly exhausted that option in, in electing good people? Two articles I would highly recommend that you uh, uh, read after tonight's presentation. One's called Nullification Versus Constitutional Convention, How to Save Our Republic. In there, Joe Wolverton states, would uh, the BBA, Balanced Budget Amendment, restore fiscal sanity in Washington? It would not, for several reasons. A budget can be balanced by raising taxes as well as lowering spending. The amendment's emergency provision, yes, virtually all BBA proposals include one, could be used to circumvent the stated purposes of the amendment. Recall that when Bill Clinton was president, the federal government achieved a balanced budget on paper while the national debt continued to climb. An interesting exercise, go to uh, thomas.gov, go to the government website, um, type in a, a, a balanced budget amendment, in, or just balanced budget in, in the uh, search bar, and look at the proposals for a balanced budget amendment. There's several of them out there and read, the, read through them. They all have loopholes that you can drive a semi through. It's quite ridiculous. <clears throat> Another author, um, again, look up the uh, t uh, article titled Mark Levin's Liberty Amendments, Legalizing Tyranny. She states, Mark Levin begins the Liberty Amendments by saying he doesn't believe the Constitution requires modernization through amendments. But he then proposes a series of amendments, six of which modernize our Constitution to delegate to the federal government most of the powers it has usurped during the last hundred years. And each of these six amendments does the opposite of what its title promises. I'll show you. And she does. Very excellent article. Uh, these articles, uh, videos, uh, other articles are listed on a, a Facebook page, Facebook uh, slash Florida No Con Con. You'll find videos, articles, you'll find the latest update to the uh, memorials and bills that are moving through the, the uh, Florida legislature. I would uh, encourage you to check out the John Burt Society. You know, our uh, organization and a few others have uh, opposed a call for a constitutional convention since the very beginning. I would encourage you to investigate us as an organization. Are we worthy of support? Look at our past accomplishments. Look at our issues. Where do we stand on various topics? One of the best ways you can probably find out about JBS is an upcoming council dinner that's taking place in Jacksonville. A list of some of the speakers that will be there. But it will be Saturday, May 3rd. It will give you an opportunity to hear uh, some of the, the presenters on different issues like Common Core and, and uh, Article 5 and, and free trade agreements. And it will give you an opportunity to meet the national leadership uh, from the John Birch Society. Uh, that is all I have uh, for you this evening. Again, I, the much longer version can be seen on YouTube. I just really wanted to spend time on those, those two things I find um, most misunderstood. Thank you.